Welcome to this very special event at the Humanities Institute. We will have a, an opportunity, and we are delighted to have this opportunity, to hear Professor Jeffrey Santana's research and also to converse about his work. But before today's event uh, starts, let me just give you a very brief overview of the capstone events that we have for this semester at uh, the Humanities Institute at Stony Brook. So as we continue on to today's event, let me also introduce the, oh, turning our attention to a Professor Andrew Newman, who will be introducing today's speaker. And Professor Newman is the chair of the English department and very well known among us. He's a longtime collaborator and supporter of our work at the Institute. He's also a former member of the Institute's board and he has uh, worked and presented at the Institute, uh, been very generous sharing his work and his research too. So please join me in welcoming Professor Andrew Newman who will introduce our speaker today, Jeffrey Santana. Thank you, Andrew, and welcome. Thank you, Adrian. I'm so privileged to introduce my longtime friend and colleague, Jeff Santa Anna. Here at Stony Brook, Jeff is a member of the English department and also an affiliate of Asian and Asian American studies and women's gender and sexuality studies. He truly epitomizes our department's trans transdisciplinary turn. Beyond Stony Brook, he is a highly respected participant in the professional community of Asian studies and he also bridges that field with others. In Racial Feelings, Asian America in a Capitalist Culture of Emotion, published in 2015 by Temple University Press and the prestigious Mellon funded American Literature Initiative, Jeff brilliantly triangulates race, affect, and economic criticism. As a reviewer for College English observed, and a search through citations bear this out, Racial Feelings makes an important contribution to Asian American studies but is bound to inspire work beyond that field as well. The review continues, by allowing us to see the intertwining of economic structures, emotional cultures, and racial constructions, racial feelings opens up many new lines of inquiry. Jeff's co-edited collection, Empire and Environment, Confronting Ecological Ruination in the Trans-Pacific, forthcoming next year from the University of Michigan Press, represents a convergence of lines of inquiry an innovative convening of scholarship at the intersection of Asian studies and eco-criticism, or the humanistic approach to the environmental and climate crises. It's a sort of edited collection that entails a scholarly service by advancing conversations within and across fields of study. Jeff's presentation today is towards his book in progress, Trans-Pacific Ecological Imagination, Envisioning the Anthropocene, in Asian America and the Pacific Islands. This monograph represents a significant pivot and amplification from the topic of racial feelings. In addition to Asian studies and eco-criticism, today's presentation, environmental graphic memory, trans-Pacific ecological imagination and Asian diasporic comics, bridges along two other transdisciplinary vectors into visual studies and graphic narratives and into cultural memory studies. Jeff's scholarship is suffused with an ethos of humane political engagement that also organically characterizes his teaching and his collegiality. He's one of the kindest, most generous and engaging teachers, mentors and colleagues that I've worked with. So I'm grateful for this opportunity to express my admiration and appreciation. Your Honor. Wow, Drew, thank you so much. That's like the nicest, the most generous introduction I've ever had. Uh, I really deeply appreciate that. Um, and I wanna uh, give thank, thank yous to all of you who have come to my talk, both virtually as well as here um, in our beloved Humanities Institute um, presentation room. It's been two years since I've been in this room, so it's nice to be back, right? <laughs> you know, mask and all. Um, I wanna thank, uh, um, uh, Adrian uh, Pelagosa, um, Perez um, Melgosa for inviting me to give this talk to Tracy Walters for 
the Abolition, Abolitionist Futures um, series. I also want to thank um, Adrian Unger for helping me with the technology um, and to everybody here at the Humanities Institute to keep the conversations going. Um, okay, so I have some PowerPoint slides that I want to um, show with all of you. I'm going to um, first share my screen. I hope this works. Okay. And I will start the presentation. Okay. I hope you can all see that clearly, both here uh, on, uh, up on the screen as well as here on the computer. Okay, so to start, I want to bring your attention um, to this first image. Um, <laughs> thank you, Adrian. <laughs> she came in to check to make sure everything's okay. Um, this first image that shows an enormous ancient tree that is from G.B. Tran's incredible graphic memoir, um, Vietnam America. While the American-born Tran is on his first trip to Vietnam with his parents in 2006, his father, Tri Hu Tran, explains that the tree is legendary. He's, uh, he says, local Vietnamese claim that the very tree Buddha meditated under is its ancestor. Monks carried a cutting of its root all the way from India, replanted it here and built this temple around it. 2,500 years later, their disciples still care for it. Generation after generation have sat in its shade in pursuit of enlightenment. Now, corresponding to this tree is a life lesson from Confucius that Tran quotes on the preceding page. The quote goes, a man without history is a tree without roots. Tran's father inscribed this quote into a history book about the Vietnam War that he gave to his son as a high school graduation gift. To be sure, the quote places the tree in the historical context of Tran's family in the United States, who are all Vietnam War refugees, as well as Tran's own place in the history of ancestry, origins, migration, within and beyond his family's Southeast Asian homeland. Yet the quote also implies the problem of historical erasure and alienation from ancestral origins for those Vietnamese Americans, such as Tran, who are American born, children of refugee parents, born and raised in the United States after the war's end on April 30th, 1975. So together, the legendary tree and the Confucius lesson preceding it signify the collective history of the Vietnamese people, both in Vietnam and in the diaspora. For Tran, this collective history includes his family history, inextricable from histories of colonialism and war in Vietnam, that he must not only understand and remember as cultural inheritance, but also retrieve and reconstruct as multi-generational ethnic history. And Tran does retrieve his family history by creatively reconstructing it through his comics art, which affirms his responsibility to know and culturally inherit the history of the Vietnamese people and assert his resistance to forgetting and losing this collective history in America. Through both the Vietnamese people's ecological imagination and Tran's ability to visualize this imagination in his graphic memoir, the tree signifies a multivalent sense of place and history. For in Vietnam America, natural world imagery implies remembering history and commemorating place, as well as origins and belonging in an originary homeland from which all Vietnamese diasporic scatterings commence. It likewise exemplifies how the formal aspects of comics make visible the physical and temporal displacements of violence that characterize a diasporic subjectivity, a war refugee's psychological state when experiencing, exhibiting, and reliving the trauma of losing home and self because of forced relocation during the war and after. My examination of Vietnam America focuses on Tran's depiction of this diasporic subjectivity through his portrayal of his parents who tell him about growing up in rural villages when French and American military forces occupied Vietnam. 
They remember experiencing the violence of their homeland's militarized physical environment and feeling traumatized by the furious transformation of the natural landscape into a war zone, forcibly displaced within and beyond their own country by this violence. Trans parents suffer the loss of place and home that constitutes in large part their diasporic subjectivity. By illustrating his parents' memories of the war and their trauma from fleeing destroyed homes and devastated landscapes, Tran depicts his parents' diasporic subjectivity as the outcome of the war's militarized physical environment. Their continuous manifestation of this subjectivity and enduring trauma as refugees living in the United States manifests, in Rob Nixon's terms, the delayed and unseen effects of slow violence. What Nixon's concept of slow violence registers are consequential linkages between a past of spectacular military violence that caused the war's environmental destruction and a present as well as future of traumatized Vietnamese diasporic experience that continues as a psychological after effect of involuntary migration, the incremental and accretive effects of slow violence on the war refugee's psyche. That the legendary ancient tree can be understood as a multivalent signifier to reflect complexly the memory of place and ancestry in Vietnam's history of war and forced relocation would further contextualize this tree within the traumatized Vietnamese diasporic experience. In this manner, the tree emblematizes slow violence and through this signification resists it as a nutritional catastrophe that overspills clear boundaries in time and space, marked by temporal, geographical, rhetorical, and technological displacements, according to Rob Nixon, that simplify violence and underestimate in advance and in retrospect the human environmental costs. Such displacements smooth the way for amnesia as places are rendered irretrievable to those who once inhabited them. Through the formal features of comics then, Tran illustrates the tree image and other aspects of the natural world as environmental metaphors that draw attention to the pervasive but elusive effects of slow violence. By comprehending natural world imagery and graphic narrative as metaphors for remembering forced migrations that result from militarism's environmental ruin, we can understand that Vietnam America envisions an ecological imagination as an intervention in Vietnam War history. Representing and resisting the delayed and unseen effects of slow violence, Vietnam America evokes an ecological imagination to remember and historicize the Vietnamese people's origins and belonging in places from which they were forcibly removed because of the war's environmental destruction. US military involvement in Vietnam which attempted to extinguish the country's indigenous communist forces to an armed imperialist occupation that the Vietnamese call the American War, lasted for 20 years and took a calamitous toll on the environment and people. The human and ecological costs of the American War in Vietnam are immense. Between two and three million Vietnamese were killed by the war's end. The fighting destroyed millions of acres of farmland wrecked Vietnam, Vietnam's industrial facilities and devastated many villages and cities. According to Marilyn Young, in South Vietnam, 9,000 out of 15,000 hamlets, 25 million acres of farmland, 12 million acres of forest were destroyed and one and a half million farm animals had been killed. There are an estimated 200,000 prostitutes, 879,000 orphans, 181,000 disabled people and 1 million widows. All six of the industrial cities in the North have been badly damaged, as were provincial and district towns and 4,000 out of 5,800 agricultural communes. North and South, the land was cratered and planted with tons of unexploded ordnance. So that long after the war farmers and their families suffered injuries as they attempted to bring the fields back into cultivation. 19 million gallons of herbicide had been sprayed on the South during the war. And while the long-term effects were unknown in 1975 and are not clear now, 
Severe birth defects and multiple miscarriages were apparent early on. Despite the American wars ending then, its environmental and human consequences are clearly not over. Rather, they continue in the present as a complex outcome of slow violence. As Kathy Schwinn Viles maintains, dire consequences are ecologically evident in present day considerations about Agent Orange usage. More than 25 years after the war's conclusion, the United States and Vietnam reached an agreement in 2001 to study the impact of the toxic defoliant, which to date has affected an estimated 1 million Vietnamese. The study highlighted the fact that Agent Orange is currently responsible for birth defects and approximately 150,000 Vietnamese children. Along with the long-term neurological effects of chemical weaponry, the estimated 800,000 cluster bombs, grenade bombs, and flechette bombs remaining buried underground in Vietnam and maiming and killing civilians is, as Ann Laura Stoller puts it, the evidential matter of the war's ecological ruination, the violent accrual of militarism's imperial debris that remains in bodies, in the poisoned soil, in water on a massive and enduring scale. Such imperial debris compels us to understand that the war's unending destructive impact on Vietnam's environment and health of the country's people reveals this war's history to continue in the present and into the future as a long durée. In Vietnam America, the war's history as a long durée may also be understood through the narrative's incorporation of various conflicts. For trans work insists on a long durée reading of slow violence that renders discernible the catastrophic dimensions of multiple wars in Vietnam, beginning with the resistance war against the French that opens his graphic memoir and which bleeds into other conflicts, namely the American war, US military invasions of Cambodia and Laos, that were designed to destroy communist bases in both countries and after the American War during Vietnam's reconstruction and reunification. After the war, the Vietnamese continued to suffer from a US government that sought to punish the country for winning the war by reneging on promises of economic aid and extending an embargo that had governed trade relations with North Vietnam during the war to all of Vietnam and Cambodia. Studies of comics as social documents and works of realism have shown that comic books and graphic narratives can reinterpret and revise history. In this sense, Vietnam America formally renovates Vietnam War history through verbal and visual elements that are unique to the ability of comics to create an atemporal sense of the past in the present. Capturing at once the living memory of forced relocations involved in the war refugees' experiences of violence and trauma, Vietnam America elucidates these relocations as ongoing in the present, as the outcome of slow violence, and hence refusing to render them over and done within a customary frame of history that discounts generational remembering in its attempt to represent and document only objective facts and events from the past. Because it employs deconstructed visual grammars, image texts, and graphic performances that depict themes of dislocation, boundary traversal, and self-other oppositions, Vietnam America can likewise be understood as a post-colonial work that re-envisions Vietnam War history from a diasporic perspective in the present and the future. As a post-colonial comics text, it mediates the testimony of those Vietnamese who are forcibly relocated to America and the cultural transmission of this testimony to their progeny, to forthcoming American-born generations. With as Eileen Kamei Chen contends, historical writing is as much a product of its time as any other historical development, and can therefore serve as a lens into major trends and developments in Western civilization. Transgraphic memoir shows that post-colonial comics as history and as a major artistic development that began in the 20th century can revise Vietnam War history. As such, post-colonial comics bear witness to testify, to accuse, to archive from and within a collective history of diaspora. They reveal the continuing effects of displacements as the present inability to recognize 
and imagine war's destructive impact on the natural world that causally underlies these relocations in the past and that continues to do so in the present as slow violence. By making visible the physical and temporal dispersions of slow violence, Vietnam America illustrates an ecological imagination from post-colonial and diasporic perspective to remediate the history of the French colonial era and American military involvement in Vietnam. Accordingly, Tran's memoir assumes the registers of visual historical writing that characterizes primary features in post-colonial environmental criticism to demonstrate that the environment stands as a non-human witness to the violent process of colonialism. As important, Vietnam America documents the ecologically destructive consequences of imperialist militarization that evidences human beings as geological agents with invented technologies that are on a scale large enough to have an impact on the planet itself. To illustrate my second image, an iconic image of the Vietnamese diaspora in the middle of the memoir demonstrates the war's devastating environmental impact. Entrapped people struggle to free themselves from inside a blackened gulf, deeply cut by war technology. Deep red colors at the top of the image, suggesting a bloody horizon. Vietnam is correspondingly depicted as a hemorrhaging wound within an Asia Pacific region that has been eviscerated by imperialist intrusions and the successive wars. As Tran shows in this splash page, the geology and geography of Vietnam have been irrevocably shaped by the war's militarized physical environment. The country has figuratively become synonymous with war-induced devastation, an ecological ruin that is the primary cause of ongoing Vietnamese migration and refugeeism. Ultimately, we can understand that Vietnam America represents and resists the amnesia and invisibility of displacements that mark the attritional calamities and traumas defining slow violence in two specific ways. First, Tran uses the comics form to narrate his family's memories of the militarized physical environment during the war and does so within a critical frame through which to understand the slow violence of the environment's destruction and gradual decline. This ecological ruin is a primary cause of Vietnamese forced relocation, both during and after the war. His depiction of slow violence through illustrating his family's memory narratives that comprise Vietnam America is what I call environmental graphic memory. The concept refers to an ecologically imaginative way that Tran is able to capture the pervasive but elusive effects of slow violence in his graphic memoir. In Vietnam America's post-colonial comics format, slow violence is visually narrated through specific interactions between text, captions, speech balloons, and sound effects, and pictures, gutters, splash panels, and splash pages. I contend that these formal features of post-colonial comics exemplify the concept of environmental graphic memory as resistance to the memory loss of slow violence, a forgetting in which distancing mechanisms such as the temporal distance between short-lived actions and long-term consequences allow the memory and body count of slow violence to be diffused and, de and defused by time. Okay, the second point I wanna make is that trans representation of slow violence revises traditional Vietnam War history through a comics form that counters this history's unified, linear and restrictive time period. This is a simplifying temporal sense of the past that does not represent, nor even recognize as violence, the continuing traumas and forced relocations of diasporic Vietnamese. However, by illustrating his family's traumatized experience during and after the war, Tran lays bare the incremental processes of the war's ecological ruin that are typically overlooked in favor of a conventional history that renders concluded this form of ruination. So the third image I have up here refers to um, his family's escape um, on April 25th, 1975. While on board a flight bound for Vietnam with her husband and her son, Zung, Tran's mother, says to him, you know what your father was doing at your age? Talk about making, giving a guilt complex, right? 
You know what your father was doing at your age? He, we, left Vietnam on the evening of April 25th, 1975. Our family crammed into a U.S. cargo plane bound for America. It was one of the last to take off before the Viet Cong bombs destroyed the Saigon airport later that night. That was 30 years ago. Your father was the same age as you are now. Vietnam America thus opens with the mother's memory about the family's escape from what Nixon would call the American War Spectacular, immediately sensational and instantly hyper-visible violence. The speech balloons containing her dialogue function as captions to narrate splash panels, illustrating the war's explicit stunning violence. An airplane flies in a fiery blood red sky while below it Saigon explodes and smolders, a city ablaze from bombings that Tran has drawn to nearly fill the page with thick black smoke billowing across the panel's gutters and right on through the panel's tears. Subsequent panels show the airplane to contain Zong, Tree, their children, and Tree's mother, Le Ni. They are all on board the plane while below them, the airport from which they have barely escaped burns dramatically. A splash panel on the next page reveals Tran, who listens to his mother's story as he sits beside her on their flight to Vietnam. By this juxtaposition set up through both Tran's depiction of his mother, recalling the harrowing details of her escape and Tran imagining these details as he listens to her, Zung's graphic memory of the war's ferocious violence, in particular the black and blood red colors of combat becomes his own. What is significant about these beginning panels, which both unfold and can encapsulate Zung's act of remembering the war, is that they set up the contextual frame through which to understand how the war's spectacular violence and its environmental destruction, the bombing of Saigon and its environs, leads to slow violence, evident in Zung's narration of her traumatized experience in being forcibly relocated away from her homeland to the United States. Tran's imaginary depiction of his mother's account of the war's militarized physical environment exemplifies resistance to forgetting the histories of colonialism and war in Vietnam, a characteristic feature of environmental graphic memory in his comics text. Insofar as Zung highlights the war's environmental destruction in her story, her recalling this destruction can be understood as her environmental memory which resists forgetting the war's militarized destruction of the land as a primary cause of her forced relocation. Because environmental graphic memory here conceives of representing forcibly relocated Vietnamese people as environmental, as environmental refugees and migrants, it also implies an eco-critical lens through which to see and critique the physical environment's destruction and gradual decline as slow violence a violence that becomes immediately traceable to the war's origins in French colonialism and American militarism. Situated relationally to one another, comics panels are necessarily placed in relation to space and operate on a share of space. Although the comics panel or frame structures space as a determinant element in the image's composition that the frame encapsulates and contains, it also connotes a multifaceted diegetic narrative position in which a segment of action, the image, both acquires and produces meaning in juxtaposition with adjacent frames. In this way, comics indeed function as a specific language because according to comics artist and scholar, Terry Greenstein, they simultaneously mobilize an entirety of codes, visual and discursive, that constitutes the multilayered and interactive vocabularies of the comics form. Situated relationally in apposition with other images, a single image within a panel or a page in comics is inflected with meaning that is always in association with succession of other images coming before and after it. As Greenstein explains, the juxtaposition of several panels of the same format will translate into a rapid succession of actions or of replies. Through the frame's relational effect of spacing, when images are read in juxtaposition with one another, and through this spacing's effect to illustrate the generational remembering relayed in Zung's narrative, Vietnam America's primary theme is the legacy of one's place in the history of the war and in the diaspora. 
vibrant images of Zong recalling the resistance war when the French military bombed the mountains surrounding Lang Song, the village where she was born, indicate Tran's endeavor to illustrate the harrowing details of his mother's childhood memories about this war's spectacular violence. Here's the next image I want to show you that shows this. In so doing, he implies that he inherits his mother's traumatized experience of forced relocation, an implication of the consequential linkage between the war's spectacular destruction of the environment and his mother's diasporic subjectivity in the present. So for example, in this image, a vertical tier of panels from, from top to bottom, you can see the one, two, three, four, the five panels from top to bottom. This vertical tier of panels depicts French military planes dropping bombs onto the mountains and jungles where the Viet Minh hide. Sound effects of zoom above red and orange colors that render the detonating bombs mimic the distressing reverberations of explosions and warfare. These volatile colors and sound effects contrast with the calm blue of an evening sky and peaceful green mountains and forests. Yet the consequential linkage between the spectacular violence of warfare and the slow violence of traumatized experience is especially signified in the tier's vertical arrangement of panels. The top panel shows a military plane dropping bombs that explode onto landscapes in the middle panels. The bottom two panels reveal a petrified family in their makeshift shelter as the bombings intensify around them with the final panel depicting a young child whose large aligned eyes clearly illustrate distress her resulting traumatized experience. Descending the page in the tears gutters, Zoom's narration further registers this consequential linkage between militarism's physical violence and its long-term tra traumatizing effect on civilians. She says this, trying to go on with their daily lives, families like mine, got caught in the crossfire. Lucky for us, the North had a lot of caves, especially around the village of Lang Song, the place where I was born. Such ju juxtaposition of Vietnam America that accentuates a causal relation between the explicit violence of warfare and environmental devastation that renders civilians homeless and forces them to relocate is evident in a series of panels that portray trans grandmothers in mourning. This next image is um, what I'm now going to talk about in relation to this. So in these panels, Tran depicts the grief of his maternal grandmother, Thi Mo, whose husband was murdered by French soldiers during France's colonial rule in Vietnam. He juxtaposes Thi Mo's grief with the anguish of his other grandmother, Le Mi, who marries a French lieutenant after her first husband, Tri's father, leaves his family to join the anti-imperialist national cause to unite Vietnam as a communist country. Because Le Ni needs a husband to help take care of her children, she feels compelled to marry the French colonel and go with him to Saigon, where he has been reassigned to command forces fighting against communist insurgents. In the first tier at the top of the page, the casket in which the body of Timo's husband is placed is likened to the suitcase underneath it, into which Le Ni packs her clothes. The juxtaposed images here imply the consequential linkage between the spectacular violence of French colonialism that has caused the death of Timo's husband and the slow violence of Le Ni's trauma resulting from her forced relocations, which slowly and recurrently break her family apart. The next tier shows, the next tiers below further indicate this linkage by juxtaposing a series of frames. The first shows Zung staring sadly at Timo, her mother, who grieves at her husband's burial in falling rain. A second frame depicts Tri staring despondently at his mother, Le Ni, as she furiously packs her suitcase. Two more frames parallel both women and their suffering. And most evocatively, two final frames mirror the closed casket with Le Ni's suitcase, which she snaps tightly shut. The sequence of images cumulatively show through visual juxtaposition how colonialism and the war's graphic violence caused death in Zung's family and forced Tree's family to migrate and fall away.
This next part is called the memory of trees. So we're back to trees. Um, as these juxtaposed frames demonstrate, picture and text act together in Vietnam America to re-envision Vietnam War history from a diasporic perspective. Central to this perspective is a multivalent, multivalent sense of place that foregrounds remembering the natural world to imply an eco-critical account of colonialism and militarization. Such a reading is manifest in trans depiction of his mother's memory of trees at her childhood home in Bung Tao, three decades after the war has ended. So here, Zung's remembering the natural world grounds her diasporic subjectivity in a post-reunified homeland that has changed forever because of the war. While talking to her son on the phone about their upcoming trip to Vietnam, and this is, will be Tran's first trip to Vietnam, right? He goes back with his, with his parents. His mother tells him she has been dreaming about a tree that grew in the courtyard of her childhood home. I had that dream again last night, she says. It was clearer this time. I could hear its leaves rustle and feel its rough bark. For Zung, this tree dream recalls its thriving life, a defining feature of her own life and her home place as a child. As a living creation of the natural world, the tree reflects her childhood body and embodies her body memory of home. As memory study scholar Janet Donahue explains, body memory and place memory cannot be separated. We have place memory precisely because we have body memory. And we have body memory precisely because we have place memory. This allows us to recognize the importance of home as a foundational bodily memory. The body is how we make a place of our own. And a central place of our embodiment is our home. For Zung, the courtyard tree in, in, her, in her childhood home is a multifaceted signifier of home, self-identity, and family history much like the way the legendary ancient tree that begins Vietnam America embodies the collective history of the Vietnamese people. Because the tree serves as a palimpsest for Zung's memory of her childhood home, a place essential to her self-identity before trauma, for her to find this tree now gone, disappeared, and returning to her home would therefore be an intensely upsetting event. In the page that shows her return to Lan Song, Tran depicts his mother's homecoming as a happy occasion that, reju that rejuvenates her until she arrives at her childhood home and discovers the courtyard has been cleared out. Don't you remember, her brother says, that's where the family tree stood. This vertical tier of panels that ends with a frame that splits Zong's face in half, right? At the very bottom, you can see this. The left part illustrates her face as a child, and the right part depicts her distress in the present. This raises a host of questions. Is it significant the lost tree was the family tree? How are we to understand Tran's split image of his mother in the psychological context of her traumatized experience? How are we to comprehend the image in the historical context of, Vietnam's, of, of Vietnamese forced migration and diaspora? As with the vertical tier of panels that depict French military planes bombing the mountains and jungles where the Viet Minh hide during the resistance war, the vertical tier of panels that show Zung's distress over the loss of the tree in a post-reunified Vietnam also implies the consequential linkage between militarism's physical violence and its long-term traumatizing effect on civilians. In this regard, both tiers narratively indicate the war's environmental ruin as a primary reason for Zung's and her family's forced migration and the slow violence of their ensuing trauma. Zung is reminded of her trauma when she realizes the family tree has been lost. And further, her brother implicitly demands this remembering when he asks, don't you remember? The vertical and descending arrangement of the tears panels is also important to narrate cumulatively the significance of the tree within a natural world setting for remembering place and affirming home. Beginning with the panel at the top of the tier, both text, caption, and speech balloons, and picture, images of Zoom in livid, blackish blue colors, act together to demonstrate how creations of the natural world reflect Zoom's childhood body and embody her memory of home when she was a child. Trans narration and the caption inside the top two panels 
Every sight, sound, and smell transported her further and further back and unlocking long buried memories of her forgotten childhood directs our interpretation of the panel's image of the panel's images in which Zung smells cooking food and holds in her hands fruit she once ate as a child. The tears third panel reveals her as a young girl, rejuvenated by remembering the natural world, a remembering that is inseparable from her memory of home and that enables her to recognize the importance of home as a foundational bodily memory. The vertical layering of the panels in this tier then exemplifies the unique way in which a post-colonial comics form narrativizes remembering place and the natural world as a palimpsest of personal and historical memory of Vietnamese people, such as Zung, who are diasporic. And more obliquely, the vertical tiers layering evokes an imaginary inscription on the page that reflects the hybridity and unhomeliness of Vietnamese past, as well as an eco-critical acknowledgement of the indelible traces of colonialism, war, and diaspora and Vietnam's present. So I think in the sake of time, I'm going to um, skip over some pages um, and get on to the last two images. There's so many wonderful images that I want to show you from this, uh, from Trans Graphic Memoir. What I can suggest is get a copy of this graphic memoir because not only is it a joy to read, but it's also a pleasure to teach. I've taught this graphic memoir a number of times and my students always love it. Um, Okay, so I'm going to skip ahead to uh, the last images, the last two images. Um, okay, so this is an image um, where, again, you can see there's this leaf, right? Trees and leaves are motifs throughout the graphic memoir, and you come to realize as you're reading this, as you're reading it, that the that the leaves of the tree. Uh, that become unloosened and they float around on the pages are powerful signifiers of diaspora, right? Of the family's relocation. And here you see a black and white um, image um, with the family that's escaping onto the airplane. And of course you have a leaf that's, that's floating with them onto that airplane. Um, okay, so, to end, I want to um, look at this last image, which is literally um, the very end of, of Vietnam America, where Tran shows the cast, right? The cast is his family. And how is this arranged? It's arranged as a tree, right? As a family tree, okay? So we understand from his, his purpose at the beginning is to put together his, his fractured family tree. A family tree that has been, that has, as, as I said, from, from colonialism, from war, fallen apart. And as an American born um, Vietnamese, he doesn't understand what has happened to his family fully until he makes these trips and he's an adult and he has the artistic skills to express and create, right, as a work of art, his family tree. Okay. So, uh, that trend both begins and ends his memoir with the Confucius quote, which his father inscribed into the Vietnam War history book that he gave to his son as a gift, indicates that Tran understands the parallel between his own labor as a graphic artist to creatively reconstruct his family history and his father's own training, because the father was also a painter. Okay? But during the war, all of his paintings were destroyed um, and he no longer painted after. Um, so he portrays his father's training as a painter to, to portray the historical sites and places of Vietnam's beautiful landscapes. Um, this last image, image nine, Tran conveys this parallel playfully through the family tree that opens and closes Vietnam America, likening his graphic memoir to a cinematic or televised production that introduces his family members as the cast in a movie or TV sitcom. Among other things, this visual reconstruction of the family tree, which attempts to piece Tran's family history back together, connotes his admiration for his father's career as an artist in Vietnam, and in turn, his father's empathic recognition for his son as he attempts to succeed on his own as a young artist in America. 
By beginning and ending Vietnam America with the Confucius life lesson that is figuratively braided with the family tree, Tran thus affirms his responsibility to understand and culturally inherit the history of the Vietnamese people and avow remembering a connection with, as well as a place within this collective history in America. Vietnam America shows and remembers them, the violence wrought by the environmental destruction of colonialism and war. It illustrates the diaspora of people who were and continue to be dispossessed and displaced by the slowly unfolding ecological catastrophes of multiple imperialist incursions and the wars resulting from these imperialisms. As a unique genre of the comics form, trans work makes visible the temporal dispersions of slow violence and thus offers a way to change how we perceive, recall, and respond to a variety of social crises in the present historical moment. Crises such as the environmental calamities produced by centuries of plunder, conquest, and war that have ravaged the global south native habitats. I will end there. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. It's been, uh, well, okay, can you hear me? I'm not sure. Yes, I can hear you. I okay. just, uh, I'm trying well, to figure out how to unshare it. Okay, well, thank you so much, Professor Santana. It was really a thought-provoking and highly engaged, engaging presentation. I'm certain that there are many questions and comments uh, that will want to start a dialogue with you. But first, uh, we have uh, a response, a more formal response from uh, Lisa Diedrich. And let me see something. Uh, who will now deliver this response. Lisa Diedrich is professor and chair of women's studies, sorry, women, gender and sexuality studies uh, at Stony Brook University. Her research and teaching interests are in critical medical studies, disability studies, feminist science studies and graphic medicine. She's the author of Indirect Action, Schizophrenia, Epilepsy, AIDS and the Course of Health Activism and also of treatments, language, politics, and the culture of illness. I don't know this, but I sense that this response is, is part of a longer and continuing conversation with Jeffrey Santana uh, about comics and how comics can become a tool of cultural and theoretical inquiry. Both of them have the visionary gesture of co-directing what must be the first dissertation produced as a comic by a graduate student, Kay Sohini, if the first probably at Stony Brook, I don't know if uh, the first in the US, but probably. Uh, this is a visionary move, as I said before, that opens up traditional forms of academic research to visual, textual media, mixed media like comics in a way that has not been done before. We had the pleasure of listening to Kay Sohini maybe two weeks ago, and we saw the depth with which she's questioning the media and using it as a dissertation research uh, uh, arena, a place to, uh, to develop that. So it is now my distinct pleasure to welcome Professor Diedrich, and I encourage you to give her your warmest welcome too. Thank you, Professor Diedrich. Thank you. Thank welcome. you, Adrian. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. I don't have a super formal, I just want to engage with some things that um, Jeff presented about. Um, but I want to also say, Jeff, you're missing this. There's lots of really great comments in the chat oh. saying how great your talk was. So that's all there. People mm -hmm. put questions in the chat. If you've got questions, I don't know whether there's actually a question yet, but po post your questions in the chat, um, folks who are remote. Um, so <laughs> what I just wanted to say, um, first of all, is that yes, I actually uh, think of Jeff as a, a really important collaborator and we have had the pleasure of working with a lot of, a number of graduate students, and we are co-directing Kay's dissertation, and that just feels really exciting. Um, I mean, Kay's dissertation is exciting, but it's actually been just such a pleasure to work with Jeff on that. Um, so, and, and we've worked together on a lot of stuff, and we both teach, I brought my copy, Vietnam America, um, so I was really uh, taken with your reading of the text and I learned so much. I've taught it a couple of times. The whole idea of thinking about 
um, slow violence, um, the kind of difference between spectacular and slow violence that gets portrayed in the, the book is like, that's so brilliant. And even just the idea of the ecological, I mean, this is where you need to talk to people and learn from them um, because I didn't even think about the idea of the ecological until I um, heard you speak and read some of your work on this. So I'm really grateful for that. What I thought I would do to sort of kick off a discussion about Jeff's presentation is just um, mention a couple of things about composition and style um, and, and just get some of your thoughts about this. Because I, and I actually do want to start by showing one of your images. So let's see if I can do this. Wait a minute, I wanna share. Okay, I wanna share. Hey, yeah, talking to myself. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Um, and I wanna start with the first one. So let's, let's play from the start and try it that way. And then I'm gonna lose everybody. Yeah, okay, good. We did that, yay, cheer, come on. Um, okay, yes. Um, so one of the things, I mean, this is so, uh, trees and leaves, key motifs, as you said, and um, this idea of the tree as in a kind of environmental metaphor. Mm -hmm. I hadn't really thought of it, uh, although it's there, and I've, I've, when I've taught this, I've definitely looked at the tree and the importance of tree, and also the importance of the family tree, right? Um, so I really appreciate your reading of that. One of the things I, I think is kind of interesting about this is the, the way, the different perspectives of um, the, the view, how we're supposed to look at this, right? And so one of the things that you <laughs> kind of really helped me think about is actually, and now I can't point, but in the, in the lower left tier, we actually are seeing from the position of the tree. Mm -hmm. And I think this is really interesting that Tron does this sort of in, in multiple places where we're actually, and I didn't think about it this way until, Jeff, you helped me think about it this way. He's actually giving sort of agency to the environment. Yeah. Um, and we're, we're sort of meant to see from that position. So I wondered just if you could talk a little bit more about that sort of composition, how he sort of composes the page. Because as you said, I mean, this book, well, first of all, it's so fat and the pages are so, I'm trying to show them as well, are so dense with so much. And so I wondered if you just sort of talk a little bit more about the overall composition of the pages, if there's more um, insight that you can offer about that. Definitely. Um, in in terms you. of that, uh, I, 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 I want to thank you for, um, for putting, okay, I didn't think about this before. It's almost like uh, in film studies, right? You yes, would refer no. to this as a crane shot. Yeah. Or you look down from the camera high above. Um, and you're absolutely right. I never noticed that before. So, yeah. so I want to thank you for one for. Well, you said something. it's cinematic. It is very yeah. cinematic. Yeah. So you, yeah. You, got that, but I think it's cinematic in the way that it shows different shots on the same page, simultaneously on That's the same page. That's one of the things I love about this graphic narrative and, and others as well. There's always, just like when you watch a, a, you know, a great film, although, as I said, graphic narrative has its own language, there's always something new that you see that you discover, right? Mm -hmm. And in this case, it's perspective. Mm -hmm. And I, I agree with you. Um, it's the perspective of the tree. As I mentioned in my, in my reading of this tree, um, one of the, uh, I think one of the key points of argument in post-colonial, in the field of, and it's a growing field um, uh, of post-colonial environmentalism or post-colonial ecologies is that the non-human natural world stands as witness. Yes, right? exactly. Not only as witness to, um, you know, to the histories of, of war and, and imperialist um, occupation, militarism, especially the militarized physical environment. But the natural world stands uh, for the collective history of yeah. the people, right? Um, so, there is, so, so the natural world is inseparable you know, from the people. So mm -hmm. that binary that separates humans from non-humans mm -hmm. um, is a binary that is falsely constructed, right? 
So perspective and the way that Tran has drawn this image through the formal features of comics, right? To give the tree, to not only show us the immensity of that tree and to show us that it has agency, it mm -hmm. has agency through bearing witness, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. exactly. But he does so as well through, uh, through this crane shot, right? Mm -hmm. through, this, through this view that the tree is actually looking down on them. It's like almost, again, like to use language in film studies, like the shot reverse shot, right? You yeah. see the tree, how it's looking at them, and Tran and his father, although, you know, the son is being disrespectful, mm -hmm. right? He's playing on the elephant and the father mm -hmm. says, get off that elephant. But you see that they go back and forth. Yeah. So, so I, I think in terms of composition, um, it has this effect when, where you, the fact that he begins his, his graphic narrative, his graphic memoir with this, that you continue to think about uh, trees and the natural world as having agency yeah. and they have perspective. Yeah, right, yeah. and he does that through these formal features and, and depicting um, through the through the panels, and that the panels the panels don't just encapsulate on their own, and that you're done with reading them. Right, they continue to have signification mm -hmm. on on uh, on subsequent pages, and they refer you know back and forth to each other. Yeah. So I would say as well um, that that's part of I think the the compositional element uh, in representing. Uh, that the old, that the characters in his graphic memoir aren't just his family, but they are also the natural world. Yeah, I mean, I think that's I think that's brilliant, and that is what you sort of helped me to see about this work, and also simply that this the way that witness works um, is really key. There's a kind of ecological witnessing going on um, throughout this text, and I had not think, thought of that. I'll show you one more, and then I'm going to stop the share. Um, that I wanted you to think about again. This this scene, um, which I love your reading and you're right, the, the tears that go down, you know, from you get again, if we think about this in terms of how we're viewing this, yes. where we're positioned to view this, um, we're we're sort of in the landscape viewing on this this left large that occupies the whole left side of the page. But then we're kind of with the bomb kind of going down at least at the top one and then we're seeing it from um from from a, a closer angle and this is kind of also what he does is moves in mm -hmm. kind of moves in and as you said we literally move into the cave with this family hiding from the bomb so there's a way that this allows this kind of experience of the external and the internal at the same time. And it seems to me that that's, that's trauma. Yes. Trauma is the external internalized. Um, and I mean, so we have to be sort of graphically depicted and actually it's terrifying. I think I find it actually quite terrifying because we get the, the experience, the, what we witness at the end is someone looking out at us asking for witness asking for us to sort of respond. So again, I think this is where this sort of the the shot or the how he's sort of teaching us to see. Mm -hmm. There's something pedagogical going on here where Tran is kind of always teaching us how to see, how to witness, how to be better witnesses of mm -hmm. trauma. And that's, to me, that's remarkable. That's where the graphic form actually can really do something. Um, quite remarkable that actually isn't quite the same as cinematic because right. it's all there on the page we're not seeing shots following shots we're seeing it simultaneously on the page i agree and i like what you said lisa about um that we see the external but then the, but then we go into the internal right mm -hmm. uh, as you see um when you, when you when you turn the page and you see this it's like a splash page yeah, right but it yeah. has it has those tiers of panels it, there's a, um, I think he, he means this to be disorienting, right? When you turn this like, okay, where do I start? What's going on here? Um, that you have to position yourself exactly. and you quickly see that, okay, so the first panel, and since here, you know, in the West, we're used to reading from left to right. Um, we go from left to right, we end the next sentence, we start again from left to right. So we naturally turn to this first right. vertical uh, tier, this panel, and we see, um, and then after we, when we understand what's going on there, we then turn to the next, uh, uh, the next tier, 
panel. And we go from top to bottom. And you're right, it's like we're in this external position, but then the way in which Tran um, draws, right? Uh, the, the bomb, the dropping of that bomb, we are inside the cave. Yeah. And this is trees, this, excuse me, this is um, Zoom. This is Zoom's little mother. girl. This yeah. is Tran's mother's right. little girl. Um, so the internal includes being internal and being, and, and we're not only bearing witness, but we are part, right, yeah. in, in, in some ways, of that trauma that the, exactly. that, that the mother is experiencing as a child. So we yeah. know the origins of this trauma. Um, and they're always, and what's remarkable, and this is, this is my interest in ecological, the experiences of trauma are always linked with violence, the violence not only of, uh, against humans during war, but also against the environment. Mm -hmm. Because you can see, of course, you know, the beauty of the landscape, but the bombs are falling and they're tearing apart right. the, the land, right? right? You see the flame shoot up like blood, like blood spurting out of the wound. Yeah, exactly. And then you can imagine the psychological wounding that's happening, right, with Zoom as a little girl. And I know you talk about this, but there's so, sorry, we're, for people on the, <laughs> on the Zoom call, we're actually pointing at the screen, but the second panel on the right down, you can see that actually, the, the panel itself says zoom. The panel itself is the bomb exploding um, as the background. So again, the environment is uh, sort of, is, is being impacted by this. Mm -hmm. And then we see, of course, how it impacts the little girl. So yeah, I mean, this is, I, I have learned so much from hearing you talk about this and the ecological. I don't want to take too much time, but I do have one other thing that um, I wondered if you might talk about, um, which I think you cut from your presentation, but relates to the father as artist. Um, and I wonder if you can talk about, because the interesting thing about the, and I don't know if you have Yes, I skipped over that, that image and I'm glad. Do you have, have an image? Yeah, yeah. And I'm sorry. What, there it is, the tree, the previous one. There it is. Yeah. Okay. And that's the so one of the things that the, it, that's that's not the one that i'm thinking of but still that's um where he basically yeah no that's not the one but this is so the father is an artist yes and he actually discovers um uh tron discovers a painting that his father did in 1972 um, when he goes back to visit um and he incorporates that painting into the book. So, so Tron's father's painting mm -hmm. is actually drawn by Tron. Mm -hmm. And I want you to kind of talk about that because it seems really important. Um, the fa Tron's father is a sort of frustrated artist, mm -hmm. was not able to sort of pursue a career. Mm -hmm. um, and then when Tron goes back with his family to Vietnam, he, discovers, sees this painting that's at his grandfather's house. Yeah. And his yeah. grandfather has somehow rescued and saved this. So I think this kind of legacy of art um, is really important in the book and at art as a practice, not as an object. So I wondered if you could talk about that a little bit in relation to um, how art gets presented. Uh, yeah, again, I think there's yeah. something pedagogical going on Definitely. in terms of Tron. Yeah. and what he's doing, but he's actually literally incorporating his father's painting in his work. Yeah. So. No, I love that question. I want to thank you for that. Um, so it is not the case that the father's, all the father's art is, is lost. Most of it is. Um, if you remember something I said earlier that the father's own father, so this is Tran's paternal grandfather, um, left the family to join the communist forces, right, to fight against um, uh, imperialist, militarist, imperialist occupation. You know, you know, the, uh, and he was a doctor. And he was also a doctor. And he never returned to the family uh, after he left. And that's why the mother, right, remarried and she remarried a French lieutenant. Um, so the son, Tree, grew up resenting the absence of the father abandoning the family, especially during their hardest time. But um, uh, after, um, 
1975, after he left with his wife, Zung, and their children, um, he, left, he left all of his art, which was destroyed with the exception of, I think it's one think or it's one. it's one painting yeah. that his father did return. And his father found that painting and saved it before it was destroyed. So many years later, when Tran himself, the artist, grows up, returns to Vietnam with his parents, the grandfather's still alive. Mm -hmm. And Tran's own father kind of reunites, but it, it's not like a, a happy reunification. Right. Right. Um, but the grandfather says to Tree, his son, I have one of your paintings, and here it is. And Tran was there to see this, and he depicts it in his graphic narrative. So yeah. you're absolutely right about this. So I had said earlier that, and I want to um, further, um, I want to revise this, that Tran, of course, culturally inherits the trauma of his parents as part of his cultural inheritance. Um, but in a, it's not just trauma that he inherits, he also inherits yeah. art. He inherits really what his father has abandoned, right? That's part of the tragedy and trauma for the father is that he no longer wants to paint anymore, even though he was incredibly skillful. But his son picks up yeah. on that as yeah. a graphic, as a comics artist and does it beautifully. That's part of the inheritance. It's yeah. not just trauma, but it's also, um, it's also the cultural inheritance. Part of the cultural inheritance is his father's, is his father's art, yeah. right? no. which of course has its linkages to trauma, yeah. but it's not all trauma. And it's I not mean, reducible to trauma. Yes, exactly. And also the other interesting thing that really your work on thinking about the ecological helped me to see is that it's the 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 Tron's grandfather, no, Tron's father's art is um, landscapes, mm -hmm. landscape paintings. So in a kind of romantic French tradition. But nonetheless, that also just gets incorporated into the into the book. And we see that, right? We see, we see that. that. In, yeah, in this we see that. I'm going to stop. Let me stop the share. Hold on. I think maybe stop the share. Stop the share. Okay. Um, let me let me open it up to people who are here or also in the chat. If anybody wants to ask another. Any other questions, Any questions for Jeff? I have more. I have more, but I don't want to dominate. Justin, go ahead. Just, I'm so intrigued by the different perspectives of the tree that you were talking about. I'm now I'm adding to and thinking about looking at the tree, I guess, from below, um, you know, looking up at the tree, and then the tree, looking from the perspective of the tree. And I was thinking about like the militarized spaces that you were talking about. The image I can still associate being used in some American. Of, you know, the bombing of the failure, but you see the bombing the point of view looking down on the tree, so obliterating those other points of view yeah. of the tree. And this is sort of recovering, it seems like, huh. that point of view. Mm. And I really think that's just, I think that just that image is repeated. It seems so much in American film looking down the bombs and destroying all the trees. Mm. So, mm. Yeah, I just, I, I just wanted to get anything to say about that. Thanks. I do, and you remind me, I, I recently, because it's on Netflix, I recently watched Coppola's uh, Apocalypse Now, um, and I was just so struck about how it's exactly as you're saying, Justin, that what we get in a lot of these, um, uh, in a lot of these uh, American, uh, you know, Vietnam War movies, right, um, written by these, you know, from uh, Brian De Palma to, um, to Francis Ford Coppola, we get that binary, right? We get that split, that perspective that shows um, not only in a way that conflates, uh, you know, the colonized people, right? In this case, um, the, you know, the Vietnamese with the landscape to be destroyed, right? To be bombed um, and to basically deny or to, you know, to render um, futile, right? Any kind of agency on their own part. And the only story that's to be told is from the perspective of, you know, of, of, the, of, the, of the U.S. military that's doing, that's doing the destroying, that's doing the bombing, that's doing the fighting. Um, what's happening from the perspective of Tran and in his graphic memoir is part of, I think, uh, piecing together the fractured family, 
the, the structure family tree and recovering a memory that, you know, as a way to resist amnesia, historical amnesia, also means um, uh, allowing for agency on the part, not only of, you know, of the parents and the stories that they have to tell, but also of that natural world mm -hmm. that has not, that has not been given any agency, right? A natural world to bear witness that I think you could read against that kind of master narrative, right? That we see in these films where the, the world, the natural world only exists to there to be destroyed with a spectacular violence, right? And I'm struck like in Apocalypse Now with that scene where Marlon Brando, they're, the, the, they're slaughtering a cow and it's so graphic, right? Um, and so all, all you see is the, again, like uh, the destruction of the natural world and, and it's done in such a way that it creates that binary Really, like the you can think of, you know, the imperialist military, like settler colon heists, right, taking over the land and denying agency, denying, uh, denying agency to both the colonizer as well as uh, the non Do we have some other? I I love the way that I'm um man <laughs> doing the filming, speaking of different perspectives, that's making everybody dizzy. Um, do we have other questions either from folks who are in the chat or um, Mary Jo asks both you and I, uh, how have students responded to the book when you taught it? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I always, I've taught uh, Vietnam American maybe three times. Um, it's, a, it's, I love teaching. Uh, it's not the easiest book to teach uh, because of what I, is what I said. It's like um, uh, trans, there are a lot of, um, you turn the pages and you don't know, okay, so who's this person? Mm -hmm. uh, which grandmother is this? Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Whose story is this? Mm -hmm. And you have to explain to your students that, uh, that what Tran is doing here is really quite brilliant. He's, uh, he's not only, um, it's a matter of his perspective about how confused he was about his own family, his own history. Mm -hmm. So when you're reading the novel, you are put into his perspective, into his shoes, about what it's like to be confused about your own family. Mm -hmm. You don't know the full story, not everything's been told to you. So, you. so you are in his shoes, feeling that confusion, but also in the process, if you're patient enough, right? Uh, and, you, and you read to the end, you will understand and it will come. But I always have to tell my students that because they're like, if they're ready to give up, like I don't under I don't understand. Like I'm halfway through the graphic memoir, and there's there's I don't understand whose story is yeah. this, this part is. So you have to be willing to go through it slowly. Yeah, I mean the cast of characters which you showed. Oh my god, I can't believe I'm having to move this around. But the cast of characters which you showed, which are yeah, the basically the frontis frontis piece in the on both sides. Right, and then also the other thing that's really cool, which I think helps in terms of identity is, I mean, look at this cover, which is, you know, a puzzle and his, so he's kind of, that's him, but he's made with all these puzzle pieces of people in his life. So yes, I mean, it's it's heavy, it's heavy, <laughs> it's dense. Um, I, I have had uh, students like it, I would recommend, I don't, not recommend teaching it, but you're right, they get lost in it, as do I. Um, get lost in who these people are, um, who the different, because we get many, many, many stories and it's hard to keep up. That's kind of identity, right? Good, we have some questions here. Uh, Mike and then Drew. Go ahead. Uh, well, first of all, thank you. Um, secondly, I wonder if I detected the uh, Apocalypse Now in the book, uh, early part of your paper where you were talking about slow violence and it's like you kind of, kind of that would be launched on the object concept. And it strikes me, first of all, that um, we're talking about war, we're actually talking about fat violence. And all of the knock on effects of that that last for generations are still part of fat violence. And the trauma, that's the definition of trauma after a violent event is just the knock on effects that go on for years and years and years. So, where's the, the applicability of the idea of slow violence? Effect, like slow pollution of you know the land. We 
leading up to work and work with that. How are those two things related? And is there a certain kind of critique built into the book of Rodney's concept of the responsiveness of the problem down the line? Um, If there is a critique of slow violence, I would say, you know, in the graphic narrative, and this is part of what I think makes it difficult to teach because you have depictions of slow violence, particularly, you know, uh, um, enduring trauma uh, that's mixed in with spectacular violence, right? Um, and I would say that that I, I wouldn't necessarily say that's a critique of the violence, but because I think that he, um, He's precise on what he wants us to understand about slow violence, but at the same time, it's also very broad, right? Like slow violence um, is, of course, the continuing uh, um, poisoning, right, of water of watershed ecologies, uh, the, the, the landmines that have been left in you know on the ground um, in Vietnam that continue to explode and, and cause loss of life as well as injuries of, of both of, of both people as well as the destruction that it has in the environment, right? So that's ongoing. Um, but, uh, but I would say that, uh, that maybe in reading this graphic narrative, it's doing both, it's showing us both, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not, and, I, and I'm not, um, if anything, um, <laughs> the, the book is, uh, is an argument against forgetting. So one thing that's central that Nixon makes clear in the concept of slow violence is that slow violence also is amnesia, right? It's the forgetting of, it's the forgetting of, it's basically saying that the violence, you know, is done, war ended, right? So there's no longer, you know, you can forget about history, which is a form of violence when you think about it, right? Um, and there are also, I have all kinds of ways in which I'm thinking about this in relation to, uh, you know, uh, even thinking about this in racial terms, right? So maybe to connect this to the topic of um, uh, abolitionist futures is to understand the attacks against critical race theory right now, which of course are attacks to basically tell us to forget about history. Now racism is over, but we all know, we all know that complete falsehood, right? Um, and that uh, so it's really a way in which to uh, to enable the enduring violence of white supremacy. Um, so just in the same way that I think that the America is both showing us the spectacular violence of war as, as one of the causes right, for slow violence. Um, but slow violence continues in the present and, um, and it's always in resistance to, to amnesia. Okay. So I would say that, um, uh, that trend, there's a way in which to read this to, crit to critique or to negate, but I would say it's perhaps a way to, um, and using comics form to do this, to make it more complex, right? To make it, to, to give us a richer understanding. But I love the fact that you can, um, when you think of slow violence, uh, uh, one of the first things you think about is, it, it's not as visual, say, as spectacular violence, mm -hmm. but comics can make it visible. Mm -hmm. right? So, I don't know if that's your question. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, yeah, what I wasn't thinking of the negation. Drew, go ahead. Yeah, um, well, I, I'm going to um, sort of a version of Michael's question and also a version of Mary Jo's question. Um, so I appreciate it both. I, I just think that your project of interrelating um, slow and spectacular violence and memory studies is so promising. Um, so, um, you know, that's just a comment part. Um, but in terms of the students' responses, uh, you know, your, your discussion of Vietnam America made me think about a project that I do with my students, um, especially when we do uh, Native American literature and, um, and oral histories, which I have my students sort of recount their own family histories for the oldest story in their family. Um, and it shows me that a lot of them have stories that are you know, very much parallel um, to the trans story in Native America. Um, you know, they, they um, you know, experience some uprooting in their family um, and or, you know, a lot of them are first generation Americans and really don't know about their, you know, a lot of them don't have stories, not just the, you know, the 
don't know what happened. Yeah. Um, I mean, including some that are very, you know, specifically, um, you know, refugees from the same war. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's why I am. Um, so I'm wondering if you encountered that um, in the teaching of this, you know, and maybe even on both sides, um, you know, with, with uh, you know, some, some families that have, you know, Vietnam veterans or, you know, American veterans of the, of the war. Um, and then just, I don't know, you don't have to answer this now, but it's just like a twist on that, on that question is whether the different kinds of weapons that we in our, in our classes or bring out, you know, different versions of this book. One of the things that I love about teaching migrant literature and certainly, um, uh, you know, include Vietnam America, of course, and then that category of migrant is how um, even though they have, they have a specific historical and social context, right? Uh, like reading in America, it's it's a graphic memoir about um, the Vietnamese diasporic experience. But one does not have to, of course, be Vietnamese to um, to understand this. I always um, ask my students, how many of you, uh, you know, come from families or have ancestors who are immigrants or migrants, right? And everybody raises their hand. And everybody has stories to tell. Everybody has heard something about their own family. And they're also dads, right? So there's a way in which it's exactly as you're saying, Drew, that um, in teaching these works uh, of the migrant experience, the French experience, are, are, are highly relational, I think, you know, to our students, especially on a campus like Stony Brook, where so many of our students come from the migrant background. Many of them are just like trans. They are first generation Americans or children of Americans, or they are immigrants or migrants. So, so definitely, uh, texts like this, cultural works like this, uh, are a great way to, you know, to, to allow our own students to open up about their own experiences, right? Um, so, yeah, uh, I definitely have found that to be the case when I've taught this work as well as other works as well. Yeah, I won't say much, but because I think we're really pretty much out of time but I, I i would say this idea of co-temporality which comics really gives you a vision of um you know both on the same page too <laughs> oh oh i'm producing something here yeah, yeah. okay okay good um comics shows you two temporalities at once on the same page and i think that actually is really interesting in terms of thinking about identity because you're never yourself. You're always yourself in relation to other people. And I think this book is really uh, quite accessible in that sense for students because they they can kind of relate to that idea quite a lot, our students especially, as Jeff said. And here's Adrian coming in to say, cut it off and cut that, whatever that thing is. Um, okay, I don't, Adrian, do you want to take it away? Oh, I, I think it was great. I think we started a little bit late, so we might take until 6.10 if there is another question or not. Is there any but, one last question? Yes, we have one. Okay, thank you, Audra. Yeah. Um, so while I was looking for the um, and I have to be more as a senior, I never read or I never So while I was looking for this, I was trying to figure out if how the characteristics, like the key characteristics of this people. Um, so I think it's different from, I, and I'm glad that we have a piece of this but um, I feel like um, from your presentation, I feel like there are um, many other aspects of this. Like it's, it's, a, it's different from um, films, it's different from text, it's different from performance and theater. Um, and then um, I think um, my point is, I think it's really interesting to think about like, the plurality of, uh, of the of the um, memoir. Um, it, it also goes back to um, implicated. Within the 
fairness. Uh, which made me think about like um you know when earlier um that the scene where like the bombing scene was like uh, um depicted in like five different like um, panels. I thought that was very interesting from the time of reading mm -hmm. because it seems like the each panel um was like dissecting the narrative mm -hmm. into major pieces. Mm -hmm. So it, it it made me think of the sort of iron that you mentioned earlier because like it, it means like it almost seems like the narrative itself was trying to place itself to that sort of fullness of mm -hmm. uh, the fullness or the sort of persistence of um, the violence or um, the memory that has been going on throughout the history. Um, and then that also makes me think of uh, the traumatization, uh, which um, was brought up earlier as well. Um, so when I think of traumatization trauma, it's it, it is always um um it comes always it, it comes with the repetition of the same thing going back to um going mm -hmm. back again and again and and then there's this relatedness like intrinsic relatedness you can't never grasp the point of the traumatized you you only realize the um the fact that you're traumatized after the point of the you know you're being traumatized mm -hmm. so my question I think my question so in terms of that sort of intrinsic relatedness, when you're um, reading or when we see this sort of graphic memoir as an uh, archival work that sort of embodies the memory and history, mm -hmm. like how can we like, situate ourselves um, with that relatedness? Mm -hmm. And I think this is also coming from my own question of, for example, like the transmission of the effectiveness that's already embedded in this work. Because um, I guess it's also going back to your comments on last students who are trying to like struggling a bit to understand the narrative and like engage with it. So I think um, I'm sorry, I think I'm starting to run me up with this, but I think my question is in terms of all in terms of all those um related stuff, um so how how can how should we um incorporate that sort of relatedness? And sort of like locate um, yeah. stuff. Um, yeah. Okay, time's up. No, <laughs> no, I'm joking because I. <laughs> no, that's a great question. That's a tough question, right, Jeff? Yeah. Take it away. No, I, again, it's like I, I love this conversation because uh, I'm getting these insights into understanding. I absolutely agree with you. I, I'm sorry, what's your name? Oh, I'm Nayon. Nayon, I absolutely agree with you, especially in those panels where you show, uh, you know, where we have the, the bombs that are being dropped by the, um, by the French, um, French colonial military, right? Uh, and there's one way to read that, I guess, metaphorically, but also like literally, yeah. Um, yeah. that this is how trauma works, right? And we see that this is one of the uh, original sources of the mother's trauma. Um, but like the bomb, of course, dropping very quickly and it, and it explodes, but there's a way in which that we're reading it because we're reading it, um, you know, from our own perspective and we're often returning to it over and over again. So there's a way in which by returning to it over and over again to make sense about what's happening here, um, it's almost like you are, uh, and then this is what's really fascinating about graphic narrative because it's both visual and textual. You are uh, putting together the puzzle, right, of how this trauma has happened, um, but you are also kind of reliving the trauma, right? It's a it's a cyclical experience, um, and it's it's one of the. It's, and now you reminded me, and correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the themes in here is how are the parents going to break that cycle, mm -hmm. right? Break that cycle of trauma. Um, in many ways, I think. Uh, Tran is trying to, uh, by putting together the family history, mm -hmm. um, you know, as this puzzle, uh, is perhaps one of the ways he is trying to uh, uh, heal, right? It goes back to, I think, to something that, uh, that Ajahn mentioned earlier, right? Another part of the series is going to be about healing, um, that, there is, uh, that there is a healing aspect, right, between two. To not only to tell the story, to, to testimony, I think. 
Um, it's a work of art that stands as testimony. Um, testimony against you know, the crime of, of war and colonialism. Um, but I think, I think your, uh, Mion, your other question was like, how are we to relate to that? Right? Is that what you're saying? I think, uh, again, it's like um, going back to this narrative, going back and, and rereading things and, and discovering new ways, right? Discovering things that weren't there before. Um, for me, it's like, I'm, like I said, I'm finding a lot more to appreciate this narrative because we're kind of reading off of it right now, right? Uh, by looking at it together. So that's also one of the things when you teach something like this, you learn from your students because they're also finding out like, this is this means something to me. I understand this from my own position as a reader, um, and then you learn from that from how others are reading this. Your own students, your colleagues, right? So yeah, I, I, that's that's what I would say. Susan, you know we're way over time now. So we got one more. <laughs> This is the first time we've met. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh my gosh, yes. Yeah. I'm really glad to meet you. Yeah. I'll get it on camera. Oh, yeah. People meeting in person. <laughs> They're hugging. Oh my God. Yes. Yes. Yeah.
Thank you. I, I, um, one of the things that you're making me realize as well, uh, when the word that comes up in my mind is regeneration, right? Yeah. Regeneration yeah. to the act of creation, right. Right? really the act of creativity and imagination. Hence the, um, the emphasis on, on imagination, right? right. Uh, ecological imagination. What comes out of that, uh, just like your, your note, it was beautiful too, <laughs> what you had mentioned, right, about that the tree emerges from a wound, yeah. right? Uh, so we understand the wound as something that, that is traumatic, but from that, right, there is an act of creation, an act of regeneration. Um, and so, again, it's like some, something that I said earlier, that um, uh, one of the things that my colleague, uh, uh, Timothy August, you know, the argument that he makes in his brilliant book, The Refugee Aesthetic, is that um, uh, refugee artists, particularly uh, Vietnamese refugees, artists always emphasize that they are not reducible to war, they are not reducible to trauma, right? Um, and that's clearly what's what's happening here, I think, uh, in Vietnam America. And one way to look at that, how you're not reducible to trauma, is that uh, is that there is creation, that there is regeneration, as what you mentioned earlier, right? As a way to resist not only forgetting the past, but to resist being reduced to war to victim, right? To being, to just being part of this mass of unidentified people who are just all victims, right? Uh, and denied agency that way too. So I think, I, I like what you, I, I think that there's some way to, to, to understand what you're saying here, right? Imagination and, and, create, and creation out of trauma as a way to resist being just reduced and denied agency, denied creativity. Really denied imagination. We've all been great. Thank you again, right, for for coming to coming to my talk. So thanks to everybody um, for coming to my talk. Uh, it, it's been an absolute delight.